Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting to speak at this uh, very interesting session. Uh, I'll uh, focus more on press freedom and the, the press freedom environment and the challenges journalists uh, face in Russia. Uh, since the start of the uh, pandemic, we have seen more violations of press freedom globally. Uh, authoritarian leaders have used the pandemic to cement their power even further. In Russia, uh, President Putin held a national referendum on July 1st that now allows him to stay in power for 16 more years. Uh, but I would like to take a step back for a moment and just look at uh, Russia and press freedom in Russia historically. Russia has been uh, one of the biggest violators of press freedom in the region I cover uh, and in the world. Uh, but if uh, say 20, 25, or 30 years ago when we spoke about press freedom violations in Russia, we would speak about journalists being shot dead at apartment buildings they lived in. These days we see different set of challenges independent media and journalists face in Russia. We at the uh, Committee to Protect Journalists started keeping uh, the, the record, the date of journalists killed in direct uh, retaliation for their war in 1992. Uh, since 1992 in Russia, 58 journalists have been killed for doing their job and 38 of them uh, murdered. Uh, only in two murders, uh, full justice was achieved, uh, which means that all perpetrators, including the masterminds, were held accountable. Only one of them was while President Putin was in power, that is the murder of Anastasia Babunova in 2009, and 33 murders still listed as murders with complete impunity, which means that no perpetrators have been brought to justice. Uh, the most recent killings happened in 2017, uh, one in St. Petersburg and the, the other in uh, Siberia, in, uh, near Tomsk. Uh, statistically, today fewer uh, journalists are killed in Russia. Why? The reason is that uh, the authorities have found other ways to gag independent media, uh, independent journalists. Murder uh, is the ultimate way to silence a journalist. It's the ultimate way of censorship. But there are other ways Russian authorities have resorted to. And efficiently so in limiting press freedom, freedom of expression, and uh, controlling free flow of, of information in Russia. So what are those tools? Uh, I want to start with mentioning one uh, that, that is foreign agent bill. Uh, initially, as you know, the bill uh, targeted foreign organizations that the Russian authorities believed were behind color revolutions in neighboring countries, in Georgia, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan at the time. But then later it started being applied to foreign media outlets. Uh, the list of the foreign media outlets labeled as foreign agents today in Russia include different uh, language services and projects of Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Both of those media outlets are funded by the US Congress. Uh, Russian officials were very open and adamant about the retaliatory nature of the bill when the U.S. Department of Justice requested that RT and Sputnik would be registered under the FARM, foreign agent uh, bill, uh, in the U.S. and be labeled as foreign agent. The Russian officials said they would mirror uh, the, the request uh, as they did. A um, foreign agent bill is the way to censor the information that's been delivered to Russian audiences by foreign media outlets, particularly the U.S. media outlets. Uh, but censorship is not a new phenomenon in Russia, as you understand. Actually, Russia has a censorship organ uh, called Roskomnadzor. 
uh, it's a government agency that will fill the role of a censorship organ. It orders uh, blocking websites, web pages, individual articles or video reports. Uh, and this practice is not limited only to blocking content such as, say, child pornography or extremist organizations that are officially banned in Russia. This practice is clearly a, a censorship because Rosomnadzor doesn't allow the information that doesn't fall within the Kremlin-approved narrative. For example, Ukraine is a big uh, contesting issue, or these days it's the information on Belarus, uh, on the protests against the Lukashenko regime in Belarus. Uh, Roskomnadzor also has uh, uh, issues licenses to media outlets and uh, applies censorship when doing or not doing so. For example, the websites or uh, outlets that Alexei Navalny or, or Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the opposition uh, figures started uh, and uh, tried to register. Uh, in Russia, uh, they, they failed to do so because uh, Roskomnadzor, as I said, uh, did not allow them to do so and did not issue the, the licenses. Um, also, Roskomnadzor has attempted to block entire web platforms like LinkedIn or force them social media platforms or the messaging apps like Telegram to store user data in Russia, which uh, those uh, platforms refuse to do. Uh, in general, these practices and legislations, uh, in other words, institutionalized censorship came very handy when the pandemic started. Uh, as you know, a few months ago, Russia was slightly behind some countries in Europe in the spread of the coronavirus, but then as COVID-19 spilled over to Russia, the authorities started uh, cracking down on independent reporting on the pandemic. Uh, in March, we at the, the Committee to Protect Journalists documented how journalists and media outlets were targeted for independently reporting on COVID-19. In one instance, uh, Roskomnadzor ordered a uh, well-known radio station, Echo Masli, uh, and another uh, news website, Gavarit Magadan, to remove articles uh, on COVID. Uh, in case of Echo Masli, it was an interview with, a, with an expert on the virus. The expert compared the pandemic in Russia to how uh, the Russian authorities handled the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, for Gavarit Magadan, it was a report about the death of a local man from a pneumonia in a local hospital. Uh, we also reported on physical threats to journalists when uh, in April, uh, you, may, you may remember how Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov threatened uh, correspondent of Nova Gazeta, Yelena Milashina, and the Kremlin officials sided with Ramzan Kadyrov and not with the journalists. Uh, as the government introduced uh, lockdown, we have seen more limitations for journalists throughout the country. Uh, Russian authorities prosecuted journalists on false news charges for reports that deviated from the Kremlin approved narrative on COVID-19. They opened crim criminal cases against journalists, imposed fines, and ordered to remove reports, as I mentioned. We also documented how difficult it became for journalists to get information, even official information, uh, and gain access to government buildings and official events like press briefings on the pandemic. Uh, we interviewed a journalist who works for Medusa and uh, several other media outlets as a freelancer, and he told us how he covered the pandemic in North Caucasus, in Dagestan, Chechnya, and uh, Karachay, Cherkessia. Uh, and what he told us was that he was not able to get an official information from hospitals or municipalities, and he had to talk to individual doctors, but at some point those doctors even, because they received the instructions from above, they, they, they refused to talk to journalists. Um, the goal of the Russian authorities was to contain the information at the, 
country was approaching the July 1st referendum. Uh, if you remember, the referendum was initially scheduled for spring, but because of the pandemic, it was rescheduled. And uh, eventually Putin got his uh, terms extended, or rather, you know, got, got the right to be reelected more. Uh, and after the vote, uh, Russian authorities started a full-scale offensive on independent media, detaining journalists, accusing media of fake news, bringing the treason charges against the well-known uh, journalist Ivan Safronov. For example, many journalists protested against the charges against Safronov and were detained uh, and charged. Um, also, uh, one other criterion to look at uh, when we speak about press freedom environment uh, in a country is uh, the number of journalists jailed for their work. Uh, in the region of Europe and Central Asia that I cover for CPJ, Russia remains one of the biggest jailers of journalists. When we conducted the most recent prison census in December last year, there were seven journalists behind bars. That number remains uh, almost the same with now Safronov in jail. Uh, one of them, for example, a journalist of uh, independent uh, newspaper Chernavik in Makhachkala, Dagestan, uh, Abdumumim Gadriev has been in detention in Makhachkala on absurd charges for over a year now, and there is no uh, date of trial set. Uh, another uh, one is uh, Rashid Maisigov, who uh, also in the Caucasus, who first was put in prison last year, then released under house arrest, and has been unfree uh, for over a year now. And four of those journalists in jail are Crimean journalists, detained in Rostov-Nadanu, Rostov-on-Don, or in Crimea. Uh, and we include them in the Russia section of our prison census because it is the Russian authorities who jailed them. Uh, so if we look at the uh, press freedom environment in Russia and uh, in larger region, uh, and, 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 and if we try to look into the immediate future, uh, what is next, uh, in my opinion, is that Authoritarianism, well, it has been on, on the rise in recent years globally, and overall we are witnessing the erosion of democratic institutions in Eastern Europe and the rest of the socialist bloc. Uh, and this process is likely to continue. For example, last month we seized two representatives, one on human rights and the other one on media freedom, did not get their mandates extended. Yeah. And in Russia, uh, as I said, authoritarianism grows stronger. We are likely to see more attempts to silence journalists and control the internet. Uh, at the same time, I would say that there is a silver lining. Uh, there are new media outlets, startups. Some of them have been run from abroad, uh, such as Medusa, The Bell, Project, and also there are younger bloggers who produce uh, blogs on YouTube, there are new channels with thousands of sub subscribers on Telegram. Uh, I think we would, will not see the Cold War type uh, censorship, like full blanket censorship anymore in Russia. I, I, I remain optimistic. I think younger Russians want to have free and accessible information. The internet is their main platform. They are not, they are not um, the audience of the main TV channels that still remain under 100% control of the Kremlin. Uh, they don't want to succumb to the state propaganda. And also one uh, thing that makes me more uh, optimistic about the future of Russian journalism is uh, the solidarity among journalists themselves. The case of Ivan Vilnov from last year, you may remember it very well when a lot of uh, Russian journalists and other members of the R Russian society came in support of Ivan Golunov and he was released very quickly after being detained on some trumped up charges. Uh, most recently, uh, it is the case of Svetlana Prokopieva, the journalist uh, from Pskov in Western Russia, and Ivan Safronov, uh, as I mentioned, and also the case of Abdul Mumin Gajib in Dagestan, where a lot of journalists also uh, demonstrate incredible, incredible solidarity in defending their uh, co-workers. 
uh, I think I'll stop here and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions.